So we'll have our panelists introduce themselves one by one, and we'll start at the end here. That'd be me. I'm Greg Bizarro, and my company's JFE Films, and uh, I think that's why I was sort of picked for this, though. Uh, my uh, expertise is in video, some with television. I do uh, actually I'm contracted a lot in television and uh, and then in film, and we'll get into some, you know, perhaps some of my experience with again with film and marketing films. I've uh, been in business for 15 years since 1993, and um, was asked to come here and present for the next two days. Uh, say my company is based out of uh, Lyle, <coughs> so I had to drive a long ways to get here, <laughs> and um, could have walked actually, and uh, that's it. <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Roberts. I'm uh, actually a faculty member at Columbia College Chicago. I teach marketing uh, of the arts and uh, in terms of the media, multimedia, if you would, which includes film, television, video products. <coughs> and I also produce documentaries as part of one of the things that I do, and some not so successful B movies. <laughs> uh, but I was asked to do this primarily because uh, I think Amy had someone else in mind and that person could make it. <laughs> she said, Joe, I want your adult utility player. Uh, I've done this before, so I said, okay. Because we try to at this con I'm also a board member of this organization, and we said, uh, just uh, like Jeff is, we always try to bring industry people here to meet with you, but sometimes they, I don't know what happened with this person. But we are going to talk about marketing, film, and it's, it's a very, uh, what's our word? It's, it's, it's very a hostile, like the speaker said, it's a hostile environment out there. And we'll give you, I'll tell you how I marketed my first, very first documentary uh, 10 years ago. Okay, very good. I'm Jeffrey Fisher. Uh, I run my own company, Fisher Creative Group. Been doing it for longer than I care to remember. Uh, always done a little bit of everything. Uh, I, I tend to stay in the post world more than the production world. You see these hands have never really done any real work in their life and uh, prefer to be in the dark room all the time. Uh, and I've worked on a lot of different things. I've done corporate work as well as uh, documentary work. I've worked in television, television news for a number of years and uh, I've kind of gotten into doing more independent films lately and documentaries and uh, so we'll bring some ideas from that sort of newer world for me into this here. So our first question, gentlemen, and anybody can jump in, is what is or are one or two ways that you can market TV and or film projects and programs? So we'll throw it back to you, Greg, because you look like you had, a, you had some notes scribbled in the margin there, so you're ready to go. Well, the, uh, the uh, yeah, this... Um, a lot of notes. A lot of notes, yeah. Actually, I did write down a bunch of... Um, of notes, and I see we're limited to what one or two minutes. No, or just, just go ahead. Of, just uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, but I, I guess the, the way that I look at it, and in, in what I do is that most of what I do is actually in, in video. Um, I assume the title Jaffe Films about four years ago when I incorporated, and the idea was uh, for me to venture forward and get into kind of where everything seems like it's heading with you know short films, uh, feature films, whether they're independent or whatnot, and then also getting into. Um, my company has been doing on and off for um, many, many years um, documentaries. Um, most of the time I'm contracted, so as a contractor, um, um, uh, you know, I have uh, you know, a higher organization or a corporation actually that will you know, pay me to do the, the project, one particular project, uh, documentary that I did for uh, Project uh, Fort Sheridan. It's a closed army base up on the north shore of Chicago. And, um, and the company, um, ended up uh, being out of North Carolina, and so we kind of just kind of worked through the internet, sending you know materials back and forth to each other. But uh, that company was a marketing company, so for that particular project, they ended up uh, handling. They paid me to do the videos, to do the you know shooting, the editing, whatnot, and then I ended up um, sending things to them, and then they marketed it. So from uh, in, in regards to that particular project, I have uh, you know knowledge in terms of what they did uh, to actually market the. Um, the documentary piece, but I guess the main thing is uh, is um, to answer the question with a question, and and I think that um, uh, in regards to television and, and film, um, I think they're two very different, um, and maybe you can uh, elaborate on the two very different ways of marketing that. Um, whereas with um, uh, film, I think there's probably more uh, possibilities and opportunities with film than there probably is with television. I may be wrong. In that regards, but with film, I mean, I just came up off the top of my head just a huge list of okay, these are just many different ways we can 
approach marketing a film. And uh, some of it's with, um, you know, the, you know, obviously the internet's uh, a, a very useful tool, whether through websites or through viral ads and things like that, which we can explain. And, uh, but with television, um, you know, they, they do have things, uh, was one particular tool that it, we could use is, uh, or you guys could use is what's called a pitcher's catcher's meeting. Uh, you could actually go down and present, you're given an opportunity to present, uh, I think it's through NAB, you know, to, to TV executives, your ideas, and they give you five minutes to just kind of spill your, you know, TV idea, and then they like it or they don't like it, whatever, they want to see more or hear more. Um, but those are a couple ways, um, right off the bat, that I can um, think of. Again, I have a long list, but I'll just keep moving it forward. Okay. This one. Um, let's see. You're right. Uh, there are, I, I agree there are two, two different uh, approaches to marketing or selling your idea. Let's uh, say you want to do something on TV and film. How many of you are actually filmmakers here? Or how many of you are interested in producing your own? Uh, are, you took, are, you, are you looking at the TV? How many of you are looking at the TV market? TV market? How many of you in the film market? Okay. And the others? I'm just kind of in between. Spending time. Whatever. Uh, but one of the ways, uh, I, I, I did a 10-minute uh, uh, feature on, uh, it's a topic uh, that uh, one of the independent filmmakers that I know talked about, it's called Riptides, where if you, even in Lake Michigan, if you are in some beaches, uh, without you knowing it, you get currents, deep undercurrents that pull you in and you're dead. And these are very dangerous currents. I know independent house that started doing this work. And they talked about people who died in the past. I mean, a lot of people die every summer, every year. A lot of people die. And I, I took a variation of the idea, and I went to a local uh, market in Grand Junction, Michigan. Because every small town has a public access channel. And I talked to the director of the program, and I said, hey, you guys have all these beach uh, people coming in the summers. And do you want to do a special or something like that? And even though I was not producing the end product, I had a market for what this guy was going to do even before he produced it, and he didn't know it. So when I know that, when I, when I, when I uh, and I happened to run to this guy at an entirely different circumstance, circumstance, but I used, you know, talking about networking, I said, would you be interested in showing this on your cable access channel uh, in Michigan? <clears throat> so I went back to the guy who was gonna produce it, and I said, listen, I know a market but you know, but I want to be in one of the production piece. And so I worked out a deal where I had an outlet for what he was going to produce, and I, I knew the guy who was going to produce it. And it was a great project to be part of. And out of that came a full-blown program series uh, that PBS picked up. Uh, so it, it, it's, the, the word I guess I would say is persistence. You have to not give up, because if you keep uh, and, and then you had to find creative ways of marketing. And then, you know, uh, I didn't know that Grand Junction had a cable access channel, but I, but I suspected they would because every small town has one. But, you know, but they are controlled out of South Haven. South Haven is controlled out of uh, Grand Junction. I mean, so this is, a, this is a mosaic and layers and layers of control and uh, oversight. But if you get to the one program manager who can say, you know what, you have an interesting idea, I can show it on my cable channel, because I control the entire 780,000 TV sets in that area. And whatever I put on, that's what they have to watch. They can turn it off, they don't like it, but they would have to watch it. Uh, now in the film, that's the TV market. But in the, so I would say start with something that you can <coughs> get your hands around. Even if it is very small, even if it is minuscule, it doesn't matter. Because you can put on your portfolio that you have done a cable show, and you have done a cable access network piece, and that will give you the op opening to that. Because out of that came another opportunity to do a documentary on entrepreneurship, <clears throat> and I produced it, I got funding for it, but based on this one small piece that we did, and I, I got a telly award for that, and I, I broadcast, there was a PBS broadcast and all that, and it was a great opportunity. But it came out of that small thing that we did, and I kind of two groups. Uh, and based on that, I did a documentary, but there was more towards a film market. And the film industry, again, is, is so much up in 
chaos, just like the music industry is. Uh, and there will be a time where I think we will rarely go to the movies, or if you go to movies, it will be for something else. I don't know what it is. Maybe we eat dinner and watch a movie in the theaters, something like that. Very happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have those things. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but I got involved in an independent, uh, like a B-movie project. You know what B-movies are? Not for theater release and all those things. And the, the biggest lesson I learned there was not only finding money for it, because you have to be crazy to put money into a B-movie, but there are certain genres, it's, and it was a cult slasher movie. That's what it was. <laughs> and, and if it's a cult, I mean, and there are people who watch those movies. No matter how bad or good it is, <laughs> if it's gory, if you can cut somebody's head off and it's rolling down the, and the guy's neck is spewing blood and all that, people like that stuff. But, but I don't know why, I'm not, I'm not making a judgment. All I know is this movie was all about that. It was called Backwoods, a bunch of high school kids going to, uh, after high school, I mean, last day of high school, they decided to go into this woods, have a nice party, and two crazy guys try killing one after <laughs> Very, very simple storyline, but it was, it was all about the killing. It was all about the, you know, goriness of it. And we were, and, and somebody, and one of the production guys, forgot to tell the lo local cops. Because as we were filming, the cops came. Because all they could see from far was somebody taking an ax. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and they had a permit to do something, but they didn't know it was a film. It was going to slash people's head off. <laughs> and so we had to, in the middle of all this stuff, I mean, it, it cost us a lot of time and effort and, and money. Because, uh, so that le that's a, so the production logistics is a very important aspect of filming. But beyond that, we wanted to find a market for this. And I, and I always thought, you know what, the other TV thing worked out because I had a market already established, and then we produced for this. But here we are producing all the spending money and we have a market. And lo and behold, we couldn't sell it. So we tried to sell it to block. I mean, very few blockbusters bought it. Yeah. So there's a name on it. So they have name on it. Yeah. Exactly. And so, but we, we, we at least made 40% of what we, what we spent. Uh, but it was a very good lesson. So, uh, and so marketing, uh, the ideal situation would be you find a market for something you want to make. Or as you're making it, you get the market itself. Then you make it. Very good. Just building on that a little bit, I think access is a is a is a great idea. Absolutely, and and it's next step up, which what in cable they would call you know local origination programming. So, you know, access is typically run by a village or some kind of thing like that, and it's, and it's a great opportunity to get your feet wet in a low risk area, even have access to equipment and things like that after your college career kind of thing. Uh, but that more importantly, they're hungry for product. If you they have so many hours a day that they need to film, fill rather, and looking for ideas to fill that. And, and though they tend to be very parochial in nature, they want to feature the things that are in their town, they're not necessarily not open to other ideas that way. And then up from that is LO, so the I mean, local origination. And so cable companies, by law, have to do certain coverage in the area and, and do that. And that's really where I came up through. I came up through Access and I came up through LO. And so we were producing all of the community things that we were doing. And I worked essentially on a freelance basis in that day, whether I was shooting or cutting. Uh, but again, the same concept, very hungry for ideas. So if you have an idea for a show and bring that, you're pitching that way. Moving up then into something like network television, probably more way up here. But there are a lot of cable stations out there, and they need content as well. So take something like Discovery Channel. I mean, they basically pay like about you know 100, 125 thousand dollars for an hour of TV. That's what they're looking for. So if you have an idea for a documentary that fits within that Discovery uh, kinds of parameters, knowing that you know it's got to be HD and it's got to have very specific audio needs, very different standards in a DTV world than in the past, is to take that idea to them, knowing that that's what it's going, that's the money that they have for an hour of television. So all those little documentaries on TLC and Discovery Channel and, and their ilk that way, that's basically what they're paying. So if you can put together a package that's going to allow you to bring it in that way. But what's going to scare them as a first time person is I write books. And what do you think is on the mind of the publisher? What is, if you write your first book, you've never written a book before, what are they most concerned about? Why is anybody going to buy it? No, they're most concerned about, will you finish it? Because you've never <laughs> written a book before. 
And that's kind of the way they would look at a first timer. Can you actually do this? Yeah, we love your proposal. It's fantastic. You're going to bring it in for uh, $89,000, which means you're going to make $11,000 on the deal, kind of thing like that. But they're also going to say they're first timers. Can they've done it? Have they done it? And that harkens back to that kind of reputation. You put it into a public access type thing. You prove you have a track record of things that you do. If you want to pitch a series, go out and start making that series and start doing it with whatever you can. And now you've got a track record. Because I, I firmly believe, and I'll talk about this in my session tomorrow, is people buy reputation, what you've already done. right? People don't usually discover an artist necessarily when they're, when they're brand new. They tend to discover them later, when they already have a reputation. Oh, I like that album. You should hear it. You're going to love it. And people buy that and know that the next album that um, uh, Dave Matthews is going to put out, people are just going to go buy it, sight unseen. Because if they like them and there's the reputation, they're buying their reputation, not the actual songs at that point, because it's sight unseen that way. So that's the way to kind of look at television that way. On the film side, to, uh, with the work that, I, that I've been doing with Christos would be uh, film festivals. Uh, film festivals, although, are very, 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 very difficult. Uh, a lot of things that people don't necessarily understand about film festivals, one, it's very cliquish. Two, it's very much so an alumni kind of thing. Many film festivals will give uh, precedence to somebody who's already been or won in a previous film festival before they even bring in a film. And so you come in uh, and they've got 10 features, but eight of those people have been in that festival before. Uh, you're going to have a hard time getting in there. So the way around that is to look for newer festivals that are coming up. We're fortunate here. One's going to be starting up here in Naperville uh, this next September. And, and look to get in on that ground floor to, be, floor to become part of that click, if you will. You know, trying to get into Sundance, you know, probably not going to happen on a pretty low level. But uh, with the films I worked with Christos, they started in on, on the Faith Festival, which was a Foundation for the Advancement of Independent Film, which is a fairly new festival. But what you want to look for in a festival is what it can do for you beyond just the screening and maybe the chance to put the little laurels uh, that you were nominated or actually if you're fortunate enough to win an award like we've been able to do with a couple of the films, is how are they going to really kind of promote you? I mean, you have a screening and you know, 400 people show up to your screening and then that's it. And, and, and maybe you can say you were, were nominated for a film or you were an official selection. But beyond that, some of these film festivals are seeing that they've got to do more than that, that they need to really promote the filmmakers through publicity, to bringing them in to do panel discussions and things like that. That's the way to kind of really become known a little bit more, to be, for lack of a better term, an expert on the project that you work on and be able to bring that to the table and really get out and meet people at these events. I always tell people the only place to really find work is to hang out where the work is. Nobody comes to your door and says, do you make films? It just doesn't happen. You need to take that to them. Yeah, I think with, um, again, you almost could have two separate panels on this with the TV and films. Like, right. I feel that like some of you were talking about film and then you're in TV and you're looking for information on TV. But with uh, television, um, I think, the, well, obviously, the first thing you need is, is some kind of a, a what they call a pilot, some pilot of some sort. So you have something that um, is tangible. People can, you can go around, you take it around, you can sell it. You know, the pitchers, catchers meetings, I was telling you, those are places where you take your pilot or an abbreviated version of that and you show it and that's your little piece. And you can promote that, but you're sort of limited to, you're talking about local origination television and you can get on uh, cable. But, you know, a lot of it's just with, uh, a lot of it's networking, knowing people with television. It's, uh, it's, um, it's difficult. Uh, I've had an opportunity. I actually did a show that was on PBS. It was a blues show where we followed these blues artists all the way down. Actually, we took a train down to New Orleans and followed them back up on an Amtrak train and, and stopped and hooked up with B.B. Cool. King. And it's really cool. And I ended up, um, some of these blues artists, which now have passed away, have, this was their first time meeting like B.B. King. And there's a guy named Earl <coughs> King. And two kings got together. And then we ended up in Chicago. And it was a great show. And it sat on the shelf for like uh, quite a long time. And then the producer called me up and he said that he actually put it into a TV show on PBS. Uh, um, uh, took it and, uh, and uh, so, but uh, see I wouldn't have had that connection. I've, I've tried things with obviously going to PBS and, and I've had ideas for shows and, um, and he's had uh, contacts and connections. He mixes, he mingles, he goes to a lot of these conferences whether they're at NAB, National Association of Broadcasters Conference, which I know you go to a lot. Um, so on and so forth. Uh, but with film, you just open up just a whole world of possibilities. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, this is my list of all the things you can do to, 
you know, in regards to marketing for film. And, uh, and a lot of creativity gets, gets involved, I guess, with film because now you have uh, opportunities, again, through the internet mm -hmm. to do things, whether they're passive or active, whether it's, you know, uh, a website and you're trying to get people to come to you or you, you know, actively try to just go to them through, you know, banner ads or viral ads, you know, ads that um, basically you can kind of shove at them or put in little places where they can find them on the internet, that kind of thing. So, um, but with film, that was, the, that was the thing I was going to mention, is probably the biggest thing is, uh, uh, you know, film festivals is an excellent opportunity with Naperville and their film festival they have here. Um, wow, I mean, this is your know, ground floor, you're talking, this is just right next door. I know some of you probably from all over the country, but is that, that's, uh, you know, film festivals, there's they're more locally based, obviously, until they get exposure and they become more, more, you know, national or international, like, you know, Sundance and so on and so forth. Naperville, though, is, are they reaching out to, do you know, yep, to more the national market? Absolutely. Um, actually, I actually have a, a short film in there that I did with Muhammad Ali uh, uh, with an organization called Hear My Voice in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that's, um, the producer again went to. They contracted me. They went to uh, the film festival, and they ended up, um, you know, submitting it. And it was submitted a long time ago, um, like a month ago, I guess, early. I, I guess to see the cost on the average. Uh, uh, I was in some film classes years ago, and I remember the uh, instructor told me that one of his students uh, did a film, and it, he submitted it at the film festival. And actually, Blockbuster uh, approached him, and they just bought it out for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. No questions asked, but Blockbuster then owned it at that point. And, and I never heard of that at that point before, but that is one way of, uh, again, going back to the film festivals, you get, there's people watching, you know, and if, and if Neighborville wins, you can take it to a bigger festival. Just with film festivals, I think sometimes there, you know, people will say, oh, is any film that's premiered at Sundance, and they made it for $2 million. You're know, like, holy cow, you can't compete in that. Um, and I think that's a silly attitude to have. Uh, with uh, The Craving Heart, which has now made, um, I don't know, 24 awards at, uh, Festivals, it's always picked as an official selection wherever it's been entered and it's won those awards and that. Uh, Stan Harrington made that movie for $5,000. Um, but it's a movie that resonates with a lot of people and, and that's what makes it work. Uh, with uh, El Perfecto that we did a Spanish language film, we actually made that for, dare I tell them how much I made it for, we made it for? $56 actually is what we made the film for. It's a 20 minute short. Actually, but there's a lot of in kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of in kind. Wrong, yeah. yeah, Jeffrey <laughs> spent more than $56 on, on the post work. But basically, that was the budget because uh, the actors weren't paid in that. And that was a, uh, Craving was the SAG feature. So they actually had uh, people that were paid the regular SAG wages on that. But we didn't look at that as being a way to interfere. It's a fun film, it's, it's very clever. People love it. And uh, you can't let you can't think of it. But it's got to be this. Because the story's king. That's always going to be the king. Not necessarily production values. And if you can move people with your story, if you can get them to where you're going to be, you're going to have some success in in there, despite the fact. And we've seen that fifty-six dollar film up up against million dollar films in the same film festivals, and see people asleep in the seats mm -hmm. at, during the million dollar film. The the. Uh the other, the other thought that I want to throw out is there are also film clubs. Uh, I know of a 312 club, which is in Chicago. Uh, and if you go online, you can find it. And every, every month, they have a, uh, they, they rent a small theater, and then they show, you know, anybody can come and sign up and show a movie. Uh, it could be a 10 minute short feature, uh, it can be a half hour documentary, you know. Uh, there are, there are, I mean, you don't want to show a 10 hour B roll or that, you know? <laughs> but you know what I mean? Something, something that you think will test out in the market. The other thing is, you know, a lot of uh, the other outlets is, you know, nowadays, anytime you go on an airplane, if, even if you go fill up a gas station, uh, mm -hmm. there's a LCD screen, and people want content for that. Uh, there's only so many times you can have uh, the local weather repeating itself. You know, when you when you're filling gas, they want they want something catchy, short, and very very intense. I mean, when I, when I say intense, in 30 seconds you have to tell the whole story, and that's intense. And you can do it if you really put your creative juices to work. It's very 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 challenging. It's very difficult to do, but there are people. I mean, people who can do those kinds of things. You don't have to necessarily think of three-hour feature films. You can start out doing those kind of things. And there's a big, bigger and bigger, bigger market for those kind of things. And so I encourage students to, uh, even, even if it is something that they can post on YouTube, Facebook, do keep doing it. Keep, keep trying to do those kind of things. 
And even if you get two hits, <laughs> if it's your, just your mom and your dad, it doesn't matter, okay? Just keep doing those things because in, in, in this kind of industry, you have to keep your fingers always working. You know, you have to keep always doing things and, and th that's the only way you can, you can get to that confidence level. You can, you can say, no, I can complete this. First of all, you gotta be able to tell yourself that. And then, then you gotta tell others who can believe that. But you need to start something and then show, you know what, I did this, I did this. 30 seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes. And then you can say, well, you know, then, the, then you have, you're building a track record. That's right, nobody can take that away from you. So exactly. even if you're filming, but, you know, and somebody says, oh, that's really crummy, it's very easy for anybody to do it. See it all the time on YouTube. Somebody puts up something, and maybe even, and there's always some naysayer who's up there, you know, pounding it, you know, so you can't really worry about that. But nobody can ever take that away, because I always say that if somebody knocks what you've done, you can always turn to them and say, well, where's yours? Exactly. Where's your film? Where's your book? Where's your CD? Where is that? You can never, they can never take that away from you when you have something tangible. It's very easy to sit around and talk about films. Oh, it uh, is. It's a little bit more difficult to actually make them and then to having made them, and to go that next step and, and exhibit them. And so, you know, and, and we're doing that tonight, so I wanted to add that little plug in tonight. There's a premiere tonight during the uh, film and the piece of the college two page bell tolls. We, are, we want feedback, that's what the class wants. They don't want you to come and say, oh, that was good, that was bad. They want specific feedback, because it's really just a rough cut, a little bit more than a rough cut, but, uh, and not completely finished. And I think that's very daring of them to do that, to expose that to a crowd tonight. Uh, knowing that it's not exactly what the final film is going to be, and I applaud them for that, and we'd love to see some faces and, and hear some feedback later tonight, as well as all the other films that are going to be. Did in you there market too. your uh, cards? Oh yeah, we got. They'll, they'll be standing at the door handing those out. David's ready to do that already. <laughs> See, that's a good example of uh, marketing right that's there. Taking it to the streets. Take, absolutely. Taking it right to the streets. So go to that next question. When you what? When you're uh, considered developing, how much you should spend? How should you? <coughs> How's the best way to do that? All right. Uh, um. Yeah, I, I was going to uh, talk just briefly about uh, some uh, project I tried uh, starting. It was about five, six years ago. It was an a independent film project. It's an idea that I had. It was called A, a War With No Soldiers. And, um, and I was really excited about it. That's when I was more enthusiastic about it. I've done four film attempts since then. That was my first one. But that was the biggest attempt. And everything was lined up. I mean, the, the writing was literally in the sky in regards to Boy, I should do this. Um, the the person that I was uh, um, dating at the time was uh, her uncle was the uh, vice president of and there's several, but uh, the vice president of marketing for uh, uh, or sorry, vice president of the motion picture department for Kodak. So you know, in regards to film, you know, he was promising us all free film stock. I was also uh, the same person was also a caretaker to a mansion in West Chicago, which since has been torn down and it's called the Morton Salt Manor. And so we had the mansion, we had, uh, we had the film stock, we had um, <clears throat> all these um, uh, great things at our disposal and, uh, and of course a great idea for a story and then we turned it into you know, a screenplay. We got a considerable amount of the way uh, uh, done with the, the screenplay, but um, some things that I ended up doing which would be helpful probably in regards to thinking about, probably right up front about uh, just again networking and, and marketing, that whole thing is um, is um, I ended up trying to get very connected with um, um, Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. So I ended up doing, um, um, uh, actually paying for out of my own money, using my, you know, the money I'm making in my business to pay for being in the director circle. So I got an opportunity to be around John Malkovich and Gary Sinise, and I thought this is a great way to meet even other actors that could. And uh, there were opportunities um, um, through Steppenwolf that, um, I jumped on. There was a, a dinner at John Malkovich's house in the south of France, and you can go there, and he's going to cook you dinner, and you pay for it, of course. And um, anyway, I went to the south of France, and I did go to the Cannes Film Festival, timed out with the, uh, the Cannes Film Festival. And then, boy, talk about a festival that's so big, you literally just get lost. And I tried doing whatever I could do to promote my film. And in fact, those little cards that you have are the exact same thing that I ended up taking with me to promote the film. But one of the biggest things I was trying to do was uh, obviously is to make some kind of connection so that I could have some kind of big premiere party or showing of some sort. And at that party, I could actually bring, you know, now people that I've met through Steppenwolf or through whoever to, to come to the party. But I wanted to use, uh, I actually came up with this, and I don't know if this is an original idea or not, but this is what I'm saying is with film, you know, you can get creative, you know. The, the problem is always going to be with an independent film is obviously where you're going to get your money from. So you can either fund it yourself, and that speaks to the second question, um, how much did you spend? 
there was a quote, and I always remember it, that Steven Spielberg says, you never spend your own money for, for your own you know, film projects, and it, it's, it's true. So I, I, but I didn't learn my lesson. I dropped about $10,000 of my own money on this film project, and it ended up <clears throat> dismantling. But one of the things we tried doing is to have this, what we're gonna do is, in, while we're working on the film, we're planning on having this big premiere showing, and we're trying to send out uh, um, cards. I don't have any samples with me, and the cards were basically uh, for, you know, if someone, a uh, person or, 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 uh, or an organization want to donate $50 or $100, they actually can go to the premiere showing of the film. If they donated uh, $100 um, or whatever the, the price category was, $100, then it was $250. Then at uh, $250, you get to go to the show and you get a copy of the DVD and then whatever, you get to go to dinner with us afterwards, which is going to be, and, and, and then if it was $500 that they were going to contribute, uh, to the film, then they would do all that that I just said, and then in addition to that, I'd have their names listed in the credits as contributors, you know. So I was just thinking of ways, and I figured, well, I calculated, did the math, and if we got, like, you know, all these people to contribute, so they'd be basically buy in on the film. And then uh, uh, instead of going to one corporation saying, or one organization, or going for a grant or something saying, give me the money, I was just trying to get all these different uh, people involved to, and then we'd have the big party, and then it would sort of self promote itself. Um, but anyway, that's uh, so. In regards to uh, yeah, spending money, um, I spent um, a considerable amount of money. I think st uh, figures say that well, you know, things that I've read about 10 to 15 percent of your film, whatever budget should go to to marketing. Um, I think creating a film is like creating a website. I mean, you're on your own little island, so you have a film, but now if you don't get it out there, obviously it's not going to generate any returns. So, anyway, um, uh, I got other things to say here, but I'll just keep My going. answer is as much as it takes. That's my answer to the question, because you just can't, without marketing and making sure the product gets out there, the product is no good. It's just, just going to show up. It's going to be on some shelf somewhere, unused. So if you're going to make a product, or if you're going to make a film or a uh, you know a documentary, you know in the TV, whatever, in the, in the which both realms. Uh, and, and the thing is, you don't have to necessarily spend your cash. There are a lot of ways to barter things. Okay, you can you can you can hook up with a not for profit and say you know every time uh, somebody buys, somebody comes and buys a film, I'll make a small donation to your organization. <coughs> Can you help me market it? So now they are marketing it for you. So you do that five times. Five different organizations are going to market your product because they get a small part of it. And you know that's one way I've seen that I've seen that work successfully. There are a lot of other creative ways to barter your marketing. It doesn't always it doesn't always have to be cash. But if it has to be cash, you have to spend as much as it takes to market your product. Otherwise, it's no good for nobody. And that's the short answer to that. Uh, but I would say, uh, what I would add to that is, the, the smarter you are, you know, the less money you spend and the more in-kind time and things that you spend. So that's where you're, you know, you have to work smarter. Right. I think the sponsorship opportunities is a good idea. I mean, many bands do that. You know, they've got maybe the big corporate sponsor and they've got lots of little sponsors. And, and you can work out a lot of levels for that. You know, somebody who's willing to put this big amount is going to get a big name or executive producer credit, that kind of thing like that, all the way down to, you know, if you get a million people to send you a dollar, you know, you got a million dollars for your film that way. Uh, I, I think when it comes down to marketing, you got two things. You can spend money or you can spend time. And, and that's the way to look at that. Many people always think they should just go buy an ad. And an ad costs money. It's very easy. Boom, write the check, and you sit back and all the orders come rolling in. It just doesn't typically work that way. Uh, advertising to me is the laziest way to market anything. Uh, taking it to the street is the way to do it. So if you don't have any money to promote your film, then all you have is time. And so you use all of those forms of marketing that take more time. Uh, going to film festivals, speaking at conferences, writing uh, articles, writing publicity, building relationships with, with local media and wherever that media may be. Again, to be recognized as so that you're you know, a brand, if you will. And that stuff takes more time. That takes time. That takes work. It's easy to write the check. All those other kinds of forms of marketing take a little bit more time. But I'll be honest with you, those are the forms of marketing that work. Absolutely. I've been writing for years. I started writing for a very simple reason, to get free stuff. 
I discovered that if I could write a review of something, I would get that thing at either a significantly reduced price or for free. Absolutely 100% a mercenary reason. What I discovered was that suddenly that positioned me as some form of an expert in that area. And in those days, it was more my music side of things. And so I still continue to do that. Google my name. You might be surprised what you see. I write incessantly as a way to further what I do. Some of it I get paid for. I'm not at Matt, Matt's level uh, where he still he doesn't work for free. I do a lot of stuff for free still to this day. But it doesn't. It comes back. So even though I didn't get paid a lot of money to work on, on the film <coughs> Perfect of the Happy Accident, I did write two or three articles on that film based on that film and the work I did for that and ultimately got paid back in for that. But, more importantly, that was just more marketing for my business and the kinds of things that I do with the audio post work and uh, music work that I do. Uh, so, that takes time. But it doesn't really take any money at all. I mean, you know, internet access and things like that I consider kind of part of the business overhead. So, you know, having to email a story or query an editor uh, doesn't really cost anything, you know, in, in any real sense. But what he's also saying is time is money. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, you, if you, instead of spending your money, you know, you're the equivalent of the time, maybe you know, uh, maybe thousand dollars and fifteen hours of your time. Spend the fifteen hours because it's probably better for you in the long term. And at some point you may reach, like, like Matt said, your time then becomes more valuable. Spending thousand dollars is easier for you. Mm, so you know, it's it, uh, but you're starting out. Fifteen hours is easier to do than thousand dollars. So you have, you have to balance it out. And then don't be afraid to try new things, even if it sounds very different or very, very out of the box type of things, do it. And marketing, again, you know, there's no, uh, I always say, throw the four Ps and all those things out. Just throw it out. This, it's all for, you know, people who want to read textbooks. Let's just throw it out. <laughs> Talk with your heart and your mind. And then where do you think you can really sell it? Where is your passion? Can you demonstrate your passion? to someone who's going to buy this way from you. And start with that, and then work around it. And then, you know, uh, that's, that's always worked for me. So, uh, you wanna go to the next question? Are there any free forms of marketing, Joe? We just talked about it. We talked about a few of them. Do you have any you wanna add on top of that? Uh, well, yeah, I got, I got something I can add. Um, you know, one thing I was thinking of with uh, your uh, story about the police showing up in the axe and all that stuff, that would have been a great way to obviously get news coverage. <laughs> <laughs> That's free. Yeah, but, 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 but it's, it, they it, put us on a handcuffs first. <laughs> <laughs> but you still get in, you know, and that's sort of what I mean is, uh, you know, um, there's some ads, you know, you, you've seen things that you, I always get things in the e email to me, these really funny little videos all the time, and, uh, and they're really creative. And some, um, even a car commercial one time I saw this, uh, and they, they actually did through, uh, you know, the use of, and it was, there was no animation at all, but the, you know, the, the muffler bumped into this, that bumped into that, all these different car parts, and then at the end, and it was filmed, they did it, they spent uh, like $2 million to do it, it was like, uh, I forget how many hundreds of takes uh, to, to shoot this commercial, it was amazing. Well, anyway, it got sent around to me, so, and, and, and to me, to other people, and I'm just uh, using that as an example because you know here's something that if you if you do think out of the box, if you come up with a creative little trailer or commercial or something, it's pretty pretty free. To, you start getting that ball rolling. You go to these different you know websites or whatever places where you can go and drop this thing. Let it take off on its own. You know, uh, a news coverage is also good too. The other thing is a news uh, newspaper. You're talking about free mm -hmm. uh, ways of marketing. Uh, you know, um, there's there's always um, you know, you know, the media is kind of your friend. I've been to, um, you know, plays. They always invite the, uh, I have a, a friend that's uh, actually in film. He does stuff, uh, stand-up comedy at Second City. And, and he always invites the newspapers to come out and to write little uh, critiques. And, you know, you treat them well. They're going to, you know, write something. And hopefully it's good or bad or whatever. It's a, it's a good yeah. free way of getting um, your, your material out there. They're so. just as hungry for content, I think, as everybody else. Sure. I mean, they, they look for, they, they rely on people to make pitches to them for story ideas. Nobody yeah. can come up with every story idea. So when you can pitch ideas like that and bite them out, absolutely. Um, yeah, but the best way is, you know, it, it is what you were talking about initially, is obviously going back to that film festival. I mean, there's some cost involved, but it's minimal. And when you say free, I mean, you spent 
100 bucks or 100 bucks to enter in a competition um, and, and it gets you a lot of exposure if you actually want it, um, then you can use that to then promote that. Wow, we won this film festival or that. I was involved in a film in New York where um, I was on the set and more consulting and other things, but uh, they ended up um, coming out to Chicago. They're going around all the different film festivals, but on their website, I was watching the website, and they're just constantly just boasting, winning this award and that award, and sweeping the Chicago Film Festival, and so on and so forth. But they used uh, the internet very, very well. Um, let me just go down through the list. A lot of things, unfortunately, are, are paid. We don't want to talk about paid, obviously, right now, because we're in the free section. But um, <clears throat> the paid ones are pretty, you were making up these you know, little cards that you send out and actually to promote. Business cards, they're not very expensive. You can go to Office Depot for a little bit, and you can start handing out cards. Um, you know, word, word of mouth is um, is probably one of the best free ways of, obviously, if, if someone saw something that's good, if I see a movie that's good, I tell my friends, and then they tell their friends, and whatever. I mean, if your film's not that accessible, but if it's on the internet somewhere, and the word gets around that it's good, they just go to the internet and watch it, whether it's a trailer or whatever, that's a great free way of getting your information out there. Um, um, and then, yeah, as much exposure as you can, whether it's through, obviously, um, you know, Appearances or going places. Uh, YouTube is probably one of the best ways because, wow, I mean, you, 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 you could, with something that's pretty decent, you can you know get a lot of attention. Um, and um, yeah, let's see, uh, that's pretty good for you know press releases too. Would be also a good way to uh, come up with your own press release, your own material, send it out, hit all the people that you think are important, try to get some kind of. But like what you were saying, in conclusion, um, is is really, you know, obviously if you don't have the money for it, then just be prepared to spend more time. And the more time you do spend, um, you can accomplish a lot. And you can accomplish a lot in doing a film these days, where edit systems aren't thirty, forty thousand dollars Like my first edit system, where you can get $2,000. Cameras are reduced to price, and the quality is pretty good. If you, if you are thinking in that mentality, and you're letting your talent do the work, and you're letting your, um, um, and let the internet and some other free resources do the work. You can probably get fairly, fairly far with it. So it's just, it's just a matter of what, what, what's your expectation back in return. I mean, if you want this thing to, you know, obviously sell millions and be bought up like a Blair Witch or something, and then, or do you want it to just, um, you know, just get, you know, get it out there and whatever, and have it do its. Um, and sometimes films that don't necessarily in the first year even do a lot. And there are some film examples I don't have any, but in three years or two or three years. Um, your film then gets out there and and uh, someone becomes interested. So it may take a while to, but usually you try to uh, hit it in that first that first period of time in which it's released. So, all right. Um, in terms of free forms of market, well, one of the things that uh, I guess I'm going to the next question because that's okay. it ties into this. What is the most productive form of marketing that's worked for you and most least productive? Uh, Try volunteering to a organization that needs that type of, you know, because, uh, for example, if there is a not-for-profit entity that is trying to do something and then they want to get the word out about what they would do, uh, and you become a producer, and you, if you are able to uh, do that for them at very minimum cost or and maybe even free, your time is free, Just they just pay for uh, editing, film costs, or equipment costs, whatever it is. Uh, and that becomes, you know, it's, uh, they would then market it, mm -hmm. show it to express or explain what they do. And then obviously it's going to say, you know, who produced it? And if you do a really good job, it comes back to you. And let's say you do five or six of those. Next time there's not a problem looking for that, what are they going to come to? It'll come to you. And if you have a few of those under the belt, the next time you pitch an idea to a uh, either for sh some sort of a short this, uh, documentary or any things like that. You, you can show in your portfolio, well, these are all things that I've done. These are all the impact that it's had. And then you're building a portfolio. Okay? And, and that seems to be one of the things that's worked for me extremely well, uh, doing those kind of, engaging yourself in those kind of things. It's also fun to be sort of giving uh, some of your time for a good cause. Okay, so you're doing you're doing sort of both things at the same time, but at the same time you're marketing in the film. I mean, it's all about marketing you. Right? When you when you when you go and market something or pitch an idea, people are looking at because they know that if 
with the right amount of money, you can get the right technicians, you can get all the graphic, you know, you can get all the post production stuff and you can get a really good product out. But they look at you and say, okay, you're the creator, you're the creative person behind this. How is it going to be different? How is it going to capture the audience <coughs> and make a difference in how they represent, uh, how you represent the concept and how they would benefit from that, you know? So I know, I know people who pitch to a and &E, History Channel, and all these places, but they don't come away successful because they are pitching the same old idea in a new, new form. What they're looking for is something really, really creative, different, something new. And if you go as a uh, person who's never done that before, even if you have a good idea, like uh, <coughs> Jeff was saying, they're not gonna take it because they don't know if you're gonna complete it. So you gotta market, in other words, the more you show that you're able to do things and finish it. Start a project, finish it, and the same product, the same time. Start a project, and the more you do that, you, the more marketing material you're building for yourself. And that's free. In other words, that's all your time that's involved in that, so. Very nice, very nice. Um, most productive and least productive. Uh, for me, just uh, general publicity, really. Uh, kind of position yourself to be an expert in the area that you talk about. I've already kind of mentioned that. Least productive for me would be just simply advertising, just literally taking out an ad. I think uh, people get swayed by that kind of thing. Oh, there's a million people that read this, and you know, if, if they all send me a dollar, I'll be rich. Well, you know, you'll be lucky in the million people if if one percent will even look at your ad, and then you'll be even better if if one percent of that will even be moved to do anything beyond that. So now you're talking at you know three people. <laughs> I think sometimes people are shocked. They take out an ad and, and, and nobody responds. Yeah, and, and when I say advertising, I'm not meaning just print. I'm talking just any kind of advertising, whether that's you take out a banner ad and those kinds of things. But the, the more subtler forms, I think, have always worked. I, I look at everything as being a marketing opportunity. Uh, finding out, you know, we, we throw that word networking about all the time. But, but the world is a great big place, but it tends to run in little, small, little pockets. So getting involved with one part of the nonprofit sector, like Joe said here, still kind of gives you entree because all the nonprofits kind of hang out together, just like a whole bunch of teachers tend to hang out together. So yeah, there's lots of places in the world, but people tend to work in little cliques like that. And, and I think it's always good to be the really big fish in the really small pond than to be the really small fish in the really big pond. Um, and to start those relationships with people. Because what happens is the guy you do the thing for today for not much money is sometimes the guy that goes on to the bigger and better things. And we typically bring our friends along with us on those journeys. You know, when I need a voiceover guy, I know who I'm gonna call. You could send me all kinds of stacks of demos, but pretty much so when I'm up against a deadline and I need a particular thing, all that gets pushed aside because I don't have the time to, to necessarily go through that, exactly. So I go with the tried and true, and I, and I hire my friends consistently with what I do, and, 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 and that's reciprocated. But I don't network with the condition that, oh, if I help you out, you have to help me. I, I don't believe in that. I believe in just helping people, and if something you know what goes around comes around, ultimately comes back to you that way. Uh, so those are things that have always worked for me, but the traditional forms of promotion, I think, just don't. <coughs> you really have to be creative. Uh, one of my favorite things that, uh, that a band one did, they were actually called Government Cheese, and, and when they were marketing their CD, they had big, huge, five-pound blocks of government cheese delivered to people. Now, that's excessive and, and a bit of a stunt, but you know it sticks in my mind. That's like 20 years ago I heard that story, and it still sticks in my mind as a kind of a clever idea. Uh, you know, a little extreme, but you can find those little bits and pieces. And again, know that the media, you know, never make enemies with people who buy ink by the barrel. So the media is your friend, the print media is your friend, as is, and I think sometimes people forget about the television media, that you can pitch an idea to a local newspaper just as easy as you can here to Channel 7 or Channel 5 or any of those, because again, they are hungry for content. Uh, and they do more than they ever did, because I mean, they all have a morning show now, all the television things here locally, they, they're always looking for that little hook. So think in terms of hooks that you can kind of hang a story on. Not like, we made a movie, oh, come, come, come write a story about us. Have a hook that they can run with. What's special about it, for what it's worth. Let's take their questions. So who's got questions? Don't be shy. Come on, who's gonna be the icebreaker? Chris. I have a question. Uh, in the beginning, you were talking about marketing your B movie to separate blockbusters. And I was wondering what, I was curious <coughs> more about that. 
Oh, Did you go to individual blockbuster stores and say I have a, a local movie that you might want to? Yeah. So we started. We started with it. Then we said. Then we were told, no, no, you got to go to regional people. And we went to. Then we said, okay, we we'll go to national. So we started. We started with the individual stores, and then we went national. And then we said, no, no, no you got to go local. So what we found out was uh, the regional guys had the real authority to say, okay, I'm going to put. You know, they have to do what the company says. You know, we're going to sell. You know, the next new movie coming out. You're going to have 70 copies of that for rental, but they would also take the local ones. And people who look for the slasher movies found the slasher movies in a section. And that's where we got put in. And so we were able to you know, go to local places like that. But it was, uh, it was very difficult, very difficult to talk about it because they, they would watch it, watch it, and then for months they wouldn't respond to us. So we'd go back and call them and call them. So, but some, some guys were, and I guess, I guess it depends on uh, that's why, in, in retrospect, what I would have done is I would have found out the uh, populations that would watch the kind of movie and then go to the stores that were there. But, you know, but we had, see, we, you don't think about those things when you're in that process because you're so anxious about marketing and selling it. Because you already have the product and you're, you know, you're hoping that, well, the next $10 that will come, it's going to go and make up the difference in the money you spent. So, so a lesson is, have that kind of worked out before you do it, or simultaneously. So you know, and so it, it but but it can be done. You know, it's not it's not impossible. And if I could add to that, just briefly, would be just because it gets on the shelf at Blockbuster doesn't mean that your promotion stops. That's right. Nobody could promote the movie better than yourself to continue to promote that film so that people go into the Blockbuster. That's what Blockbuster wants, is for people to rent it, not just, oh, I got it on the shelf, and people will occasionally rent it when they see it. You still have to have your promotion going all the time. Uh, and that could be the next film, which says, oh, and those are the guys who made that. You always get a chance to you know, put that extra little plug in kind of thing like that. Uh, you mentioned Blockbuster. How would you market your movie to someone like HBO, Showtime, Uh That's a whole different ballgame. <laughs> it's probably very, very similar at that point, and I feel bad for, again, the TV people, because we're not really talking a lot about TV here, but um, but it's, it's very similar to TV. I mean, it's so much you've heard the... It's not what you know, it's who you know, and, and obviously there's, if there's executives and inroads, if you can get in there, um, then you, and you have someone to send something to, and obviously there's an interest there. Um, there's also venues in which people can shop for films. I was, I can't remember <coughs> where it was at, but um, it actually was Cannes Film Festival. They had a, um, in, in France, they had a, 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 a hall set up, and all the movie people were selling their films, and executives would walk through, and. And they'd take a look, and they'd have all the trailers playing, and so on and so forth. And you know, those opportunities—they're they're hard to get. But um, and uh, it goes back to what you were saying in regards to uh, reputation. You know, I, in my own business, I have been for 15 years, but the first five years were extremely uh, hard. It was a struggle. So how can you expect to go into doing a film, and that your first film out of the box is just going to boom, make just a ton of money? So, but if you've done two or three or four or five films, now you got a little cult following here. People like the director, they like the <coughs> actors maybe that you're picking, or, or the films as a whole, they come to your site. And you were saying it, you've established and now credibility. Now, film executives would be more willing to come to a site if, wow, you have a reputation of you've done several, you have the experience, they know you're legitimate. You're not gonna stiff them, obviously, if they pay you money to, to, to do the films. When I say it's a different ballgame, it's not that it's impossible. Uh, what it takes is, before you go to Showtime, you would, you would need to have a pretty good portfolio that shows demonstration of not only your creative thinking, but also your completion and your track record. Before you even, and, and then the way to approach that, uh, for example, uh, have you guys uh, seen the show John from Cincinnati, which got canceled, by the way? Okay. Uh, it was HBO. Uh, I happen to know the producer of the show. And I also have to know the music uh, the composer for that. And regardless of why the show got canceled, uh, he is not just being let go by HBO. Because they said, OK, this formula, uh, and that's the same guy who wrote music for uh, Ron Lola. Oh, uh, now he, you know, that, that basic effect. And that's what got him a Hollywood gig. And he landed with the HBO gig. And HBO is not just dumping him, because he, they, he knows the, he can come up with good stuff. He just, he just sort of did, this didn't work. So they gave him two other gigs. But before he got there, 
you know, he had, he, I mean, if you look at his portfolio, he had several small, small pieces. <coughs> and the demonstration of he can start something and complete it and be very creative about it. So if you have the track record, then you should go to the, to the next one. So I, I would start with a, uh, it is like, that's like step three. You gotta start, gotta start with step one, Christopher. I got two questions. How many no's can you get before you can hear a yes? And then the other thing is if you have, um, if you're like promoting a movie and you're like going to a particular source or a particular producer or whoever, and they see that movie but they don't like it, should they produce you or move you on to somebody else who might be interested in your movie? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how many no's? Just, I mean, every no to me sometimes says something, whether you didn't do your homework in, in the way you were approaching that person, you know, you're trying to pitch a certain thing and they don't actually even do that kind of thing. Uh, or there may be something certainly wrong after a series of that, but, I, you know, it's easy to just sit here and say persistence, but really that is what it is. I never take no, and I never see any setback as being the ultimate thing. I've often gone back to people, even Matt, uh, or rather, uh, I was in Raymond Benson's session, and he, he talked about that, where something that happened 15 years ago came back out of the blue, because he didn't burn bridges, and he left those things open. You know, stuff, I'm constantly sending a little emails out and things like that to people all the time. I don't think people realize that. I mean, I sit down at my desk, and every day is a marketing opportunity, even if it's just just, hey, I just finished this film and I won this award. Hope you guys would find that. Boom, that goes out to this group. This little bit goes out to that group. Uh, I wrote for a magazine for a, a number of times and then the magazine folded. Guess what? The editor moved on to another magazine. Hey, Stuart, how's it going? Oh, hey, hey, I was thinking about you. I got another, boom, I land a gig. It's just constant marketing, it's just constant persistence. Uh, still taking those no's might mean that there's something wrong and it's time to retool it and redo it, but oftentimes it's just the timing. Is it right or for whatever reason? Yeah, as many no's as it takes to get a yes. Yeah, is my answer. Absolutely. There, are no, there are no numbers there. You know, it's just you need to keep going. And then, uh, I mean, for example, the, the example I gave about the Riptide story is uh, we went to the park districts and said, no, you guys have the, the next season coming up. Would you like to sponsor some of this or put a take on that? They said, sure, why not? It, it's a, this, we want to educate the public regarding this. And so, you know, sometimes it's two no's, sometimes it's thousand no's, so there's no right answer. And the right answer is, in my mind, till you get an S. Take as many no's as you can. But it's like a, it's like a virus, <laughs> though, if I hate to equate it to that, but, uh, you know, in the sense that if, 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 you, if something's not working, obviously you don't just sit there and wait for that, the one thing, to, you know, there's, you know, you, you change your strategy, you set out a strategy plan, you have a contingency plan, so the first thing doesn't work, then you just kind of go into the second or the third phase of it, knowing that, okay, now my viral ads aren't working, let's just uh, try something different. Yeah, it's constant, it's always, in. I agree, you're always So you don't just something. say, okay, I'm waiting for that one answer, just try something else while you're waiting, and then, hey, if the door knocks there, then. Uh, I've got a question. I am in a, a kind of precarious state right now where I, I wrote a book that came out about three or four years ago, and now I'm working on the documentary of that book and also we're trying to work on a proposal for a second book on a similar topic. My question is, uh, what's the value and maybe the timing aspect of getting legal representation, an entertainment lawyer that can maybe help you navigate because we may be getting into a territory that's just beyond us? And I don't want to shoot myself in the foot by not being maybe represented. Any thoughts on that? There's no, there's no, you know, don't wait an extra day. You know, if you're negotiating something, even if it's <coughs> three weeks, I mean, you're going to sign a contract six months from now, immediately, immediately do it. Because uh, and a good intellectual property attorney will give you not only venues or ways to do that, but also may give you some ideas that may help the project as well. So I would do it, I wouldn't wait at all, I would just do it right away. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't have to spend money, I mean, there are, for example, uh, Lawyers for the Creative Arts. You know, it's a free service. Uh, at Columbia College, where I teach, we have a uh, Ask an Attorney sessions. Every once, twice a month, mm -hmm. we have intellectual property attorneys who come to the campus and you can set up a half hour to one hour meeting with them. <coughs> free, initial, initial free, they're, they're basically gonna give you information. And then if, they, if you need to, in addition to that, they'll give you other options. But immediately, don't wait on it at all. 